Bedroom 51. I'm Elise DeLucci, your host. Welcome to New York City. We are in my living room, intimate setting. I have the worst lighting going on today. I don't know what's happening. It's it's the whole day. The whole day is weird for me. I'm dressed like a schlepper. I, <laughs> I got a floor length yellow and brown rose print muumuu on silk. You know, like uh, ballerina isotona slippers, leggings underneath, a tank. I, I, you know, it's one of these days. Fact of the day, goldfish crackers. Oh my God, one of my favorite snacks. Love them. Of course, can't have them, not on the keto diet, but came out in the 60s. In 1997, they added a smiley face to each individual goldfish cracker. You probably know their slogan is the snack that smiles back, but why not add them to all the crackers? Why only 40%? I tried to figure it out. I, 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 someone told me this. I was like, that can't be possible. Because, you know, this is what comedians do. Someone tells us the most random, unimportant fact. You'll never need this information in your entire life unless you're playing, you know, pub trivia. And uh, I Googled it and I couldn't find out. So if you know, let me know. Why do 40% of gold first crackers have a smile and 60% don't. It feels crazy. Anyway, Paul Castellano's house is for sale on Staten Island. If you don't know Paul Castellano, look it up. Big gangster, not alive anymore. He he's, he he lived in this giant house on Toad Hill in Staten Island, which if you don't know is obviously uh, an area with tons of mansions right on the North Shore, so close to Brooklyn. I am not that part. I am not part. Excuse me. Of uh, I'm not from that area, Staten Island. I'm from the South Shore. So further out, but Paul Castellano's house, uh, you know, it's it's a mansion. It's a crazy mansion on Toad Hill. Uh, he, someone, it was in the family, I think, from, you know, the, I think he died in 87 or something. But it was stayed in the family throughout the, the remainder of the 80s, the 90s. And it was sold in 2000 to a, a commercial real estate guy. But why I'm telling you, you have to look up this house. Here's the address. 177 Benedict Road. You you haven't seen anything like this. The fact that this exists in Staten Island and just on the other side of the island is the dumps. Fresh Kills, now closed. So come on, and I, I don't want to like say I'm from the area with the dumps, but I am. That's okay. Uh, this is the most insane house. Uh, if you saw, you know, the Gotti reality show 20 years ago and you thought that their house was something, look at this. If you are listening to this podcast, from the UK, I know a lot of UK fans, um, you're going to look at this, you're going to open this, you know, realtor.com, 177 Benedict Road, former Gambino crime boss, and you're going to be like, you're going to be like, is this a central casting? Is this a set? What is going on here? The house, wait, it has 17 bathrooms, eight master bedrooms, 33,000 square feet. I mean, I go movie theater room. It has a car showroom, Olympic size pools. I mean, the backyard is like Shangri-La. I mean, listen, some parts of the house, I think, are absolutely gorgeous. Some parts are just ridiculous. I mean, it's overdone. It's too much. And who wants to live in that monstrosity? But the house right now is selling for a smooth 16, what is it, 16 mil or seven? 16.8 million dollars. 16 Point eight million dollars. Um, it was sold in two thousand to that real estate guy for three million. He's making out like a bandit, but you know what? He's in the business. You know, he. I don't know. The only reason, and let me say, the only reason why how I came across this because it's been on the market for like ten months apparently was I I uh, I always like to keep my eye on real estate. You know, in in the New York area what a tax is going for all this stuff. And I was looking something up and I was just like, I wonder what Staten Island taxes are. Because a lot of my girlfriends live on the South Shore and they don't pay a lot of money in taxes at all. Maybe they're paying a year, you know, maybe they're paying 5,000, 7,000, whatever. Which again, if you're in New York City, this is a bargain, right? Um, I, at this house pops up, it was like something crazy, like $40,000 a time. I was like, is that a month? Is that, I didn't even, I could, I could, it might've even been a month. I couldn't comprehend. And then I see this like humongous house and I was like, this has to be someone's house. As if 
Wait, does it say how many acres? It's on three acres. Three acres in Staten Island is like a whole neighborhood and a half. It The whole thing is wild. Okay. Um, Food talk. Food talk. Last night, I went to a restaurant. If you are in the Times Square area uh, and you want something different and you don't want to spend a ton of money, and you don't really care if the food's not 100% fabulous. All right, I'm, I'm really not talking this place up. There's a restaurant, an udon restaurant, Japanese restaurant, udon restaurant called Tsuru Tantan. T-S-U-R-U-T-O-N-T-A-N. Tsuru Tantan. I think it's on like 48th Street and Broadway or something. You know, uh, it's kind of like the Japanese Applebee's. It's inexpensive. I was there last night. Uh, just don't ask. I was working out material in the area. I, 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 you know, I was with Chris, obviously, I wanted to, um, you know, we wanted to get something to eat. I, I, I didn't want the regular, you know, I didn't want to go to like a calm wise, like I didn't want to go to like a, just a regular restaurant, you know, I, I was like, I really want like Japanese or something. I said, maybe, you know, someone that could do a Naruto roll, I have to eat these Naruto rolls. These are the rice free sushi, you know, so it's like they take salmon and avocado, or whatever, and they wrap it in a cucumber, whatever. So I said, let's go to Suru Tantan. I know there's one over here. It's a chain restaurant, um, and they're known for serving these big, giant bowls of udon. And if you listen, if you like udon, it's great. The, the, the bowl, when I say great, I mean it's a fun, convivial place. And the udon, I would say, is 6.5, 7 out of 10 tops uh but it's a big huge bowl and it's fun you know and the food comes out fast so if you're going to see a show or something you can get in and get out for two people the bill came out to uh 90 dollars that was with tip and no alcohol so uh you know for manhattan listen that's cheap they have chains they have location it's a chain they have locations so how i found out about this place you'll die um is there's one on off Union Square. So there's one, I think, on 16th Street. And a few years ago, I went to dinner with Vincent Piazza, who is an actor. He, you can look him up. He played Lucky Luciano on Boardwalk Empire. We were reading for some um, movie, some small movie about a, a, like a grocery store in Brooklyn, like literally. And um, I say that like as if you think, like, no, that was what the movie was about. It was a cute story. But anyway, it was about a grocery store in Brooklyn. We were reading for the movie together. And a couple weeks after, he texted me and he asked me if I wanted to go for uh, dinner with him. It actually was longer than three years ago. It was maybe, because I wasn't, it was maybe four years ago. I wasn't, I was dating Chris, but we weren't exclusive. You know, it was like, you know, and I was just like, nah, I don't, I don't know. Because Chris is a lot older than me. And I was like, I don't know what I want. Uh, so I went out to dinner with this guy. I think it was a date. The food, I remember being good. He ordered for us. It was okay. But I remember thinking he was delicious. But dinner ended, you know, after dinner anyway. Um, and, and I liked it. I thought it was like a fun, cool place to do to have something different, you know. Because sometimes, you know, if you go to these Japanese restaurants and, um, you know, like you're not a big sushi person and you don't know if there's teriyaki on the menu, which I feel like is like the thing that non-sushi eaters get. You know, you're like, what do I do? What do I get? Whatever. So udon, nice. I thought it was fun. A fun place, maybe even go with kids because they could get the big bowl. If you really love udon, if you really love udon, there is a place called Naruto Ramen on the Upper East Side. That's a small little restaurant. That's fabulous. And I totally recommend. But um, yeah, went there. Eh, worth recommending. You know where I went um, that I used to love and it's closing and I'm so sad. There was a restaurant in Manhattan called Under the Bridge on 59th and I think it was First Avenue. It was a tiny little corner Greek restaurant owned by this guy, Dimitri. Nicest guy. Would always bring, you know, one of these restaurant owners I love. They're always there. This doesn't exist, by the way, Manhattan a lot. So that's why I loved it. The restaurant owner, he was always there, this guy. He always bring you a little appetizer, bring you a little dessert, you know, on the house. I, like, loved that. Food was amazing. Weird location, though. And uh, apparently he died. He died recently. And the family, they couldn't renew the lease for whatever reason. And it's closed. closed and I'm sad about that. I do. I love Greek food. I love Milos. Milos is very uh, upscale. That's a restaurant on, maybe it's 54th and... Um, 
maybe it's between 5th and 6th, West 54th. It's near the St. Regis Hotel. Love that place. Uh, but Milos is great. When I went to Milos two months ago, they did something with this yogurt. They gave me a dessert for free. Complimentary. And you got to try this. So, you know, being on keto, I'm eating a lot of Greek yogurt. And at night, if I'm on the couch and I want a little something, a little nosh, I'll have a little Greek yogurt with maybe some berries because you can eat berries. It's very, they're very keto friendly. I'll have some blueberries, maybe some slivered almond, whatever. But when I was at Milos this time, they brought out a complimentary dessert and it was the Greek yogurt. It was very similar to what I'm eating. Greek yogurt, berries, some almonds, a little drizzle of honey, and they sprinkled some of their like Greek sea salt on top. I didn't think anything of it then, but I remember taking a couple bites and thinking, oh, this is like salty and delightful and delightful it was. It the the salt, something with the salt on the yogurt, on the berries, it incredible. Incredible. So now when I'm sitting on the couch at night having my thing, my little my little nosh, I am sprinkling, you know, the sea salt on. It's so good. Oh, anyway. Something else I found in the food category that is fabulous. That's not keto, unfortunately. Uh, it's called the brand is called So Delicious and it's coconut whipped cream. Coconut whipped cream. It comes in a tub. It was about five dollars and I got it at Whole Foods. And um oh my God. Oh my God. It, I, I'll tell you how I found it. I was on TikTok one night and, you know, something pops up because, you know, your phone stalks you. And it was like some diet thing. And a girl was saying, oh, if you're vegan and lactose and, you know, gluten free and blah, 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 you know, lactose intolerant, whatever, try um, coconut whipped cream. I bought it because I looked at the nutrition label on the back and it was like one gram of sugar, two carbs. And I said, all right, it's not keto, you know, for of course, like two teaspoons. I was like, it's not keto, but I'm going to give it a whirl. Incredible. Fabulous. Like you could put it in a small little Tupperware in the freezer. You could take a little few spoonfuls of this coconut whipped cream, put it in the little Tupperware, put it in the freezer, take it out a few hours later, eat it like ice cream. I mean, amazing. But look, whipped cream has all, is all sugar. I mean, we know that. Although Ready Whip, not lactose or any, not coconut cream. Ready Whip has the sugar free uh, that is keto and obviously no sugar. But, you know, it use the, uses the chemicals, blah, blah, blah. I made Barbara Streisand's hoisin spare ribs this week. I posted the video, or last week. Mm. Amazing. I posted the video on my Instagram um, and on TikTok, and you can, uh, you know, it's, it's a few ingredients. I don't even remember what they were now, like garlic and soy sauce and a few other things. Great. Super, super honey, super delicious. Uh, most of the recipes that I found for ho hoisin, because I, after I read her recipe in her, my passion for design coffee table book that I've had for a hundred years, I looked up and I was like, oh, how does one make hoisin spare ribs? And a lot of hoisin recipes just call for hoisin sauce, maybe a little honey, maybe a little garlic, maybe a little soy, mix it up in a plastic bag, fridge it, and then, you know, you put throw it in the oven. But hers didn't call for the hoisin sauce. So I felt like, oh, you know, it was less ingredients, which is always better and easier, you know, and easier. Like, I, I I really do love to cook. I've always loved to cook, like you. But you lose me. You lose me when the ingredients are like four pages deep. Like, it's too much. It's too much. I, in this day and age, I think, probably like you, I think maybe 10, even 20 years ago, you know, and, 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 and then beyond, if somebody gave you a recipe, um, and I'm not talking about the family recipe, the hand it down one time only, you know, or th three times a year you make it. I'm talking about somebody gave you a recipe to make on a Friday night or a Wednesday night, you know, um, and it had, you know, eight ingredients with 13 ingredients and a, a bunch of steps. You might have not been as turned off, you know, 
But I think now, because of oh, all of the attention demands that we deal with, you know, and, and, and everybody wants everything now and it's immediate and there's some bells and flashes and ads and, and, and everywhere you go, you go in a cab and there's TV. It's just every, it's, when you come home to your sanctum sanctorum, do you really want to start cooking something that's 17 million ingredients? Long? No, it, it, it's, it's, we're exhausted. You know, we're exhausted. Anyway, at least I am, at least I am. So can we talk about the Golden Globes? Can we can we talk about it? Did you watch? Did you watch Billie Eilish? Let me just say something. Billie Eilish, I love you, but I like her music. I like her artistry. Her outfit, I I what the what the f was that? She what was it was she was wearing like a, a, a cross. It was, it was, she looked, first of all, it was a suit. If you didn't see it, Google it. But it was a suit. And it was an ill-fitting suit on purpose. It was very wide. I think the pants were short, shoulder pads. She looked like a cross between Harry Potter and a soup dumpling. And I love you, Billy. I can't say that enough, but really? Come on. Oprah, I mean, Oprah's just looking amazing these days. I can't, her and Gail, the both of them, all purple for my color, for, for the, you know, the movie, the color purple. Anyway, anyway, I want to tell you, Joe Coy, if you watched or if you watch back his monologue, you know, he's getting, getting, has gotten, been getting torn up, torn apart, ripped to shreds. Everybody's saying, oh, what a horrible host. Let me, let me say a couple things about that, okay? First of all, he got this job 10 days ago. When he was saying on stage that he got it 10 days ago, he literally got the job 10 days ago. I don't think people understand how hard that is. If you get a job, a stand-up comedy, not, you know, hosting, that kind of caliber of event 10 days ago. It is not the easiest thing, and many, many people would find it difficult. The other thing that I feel like is crazy that people are ripping him to shreds. People are like, oh, he's, like, made a comment about Taylor Swift. Oh, get over it. That's the, he's a comic. What the hell do you expect? I mean, you know, I'm not, like, a, air quotes, a mean, I'm not saying he's not mean either, but I'm not, like, a mean or a bully. I don't really make fun of people. That's not, like, my thing. I was bullied when I was a kid. I'm not making fun of other people. Absolutely not. But it, it's jokes. Let me say, one, he didn't write all the material himself. One. Two, he, when you're up there at that kind of event, you have to find the cameras, the celebrities that you're talking to. You got to dart your eyes around. It, the, the lighting, the stage was round. It is so many things going behind the scenes. Not a lot of people gave him credit, but I was happy to hear Whoopi Goldberg and Steve Martin. Steve Martin said, I think Joe did a great job or I empathize with him. I did it in 2010. I'm still upset over it. Whoopi said... And thank God she did. I love her. She said, it's brutal. She said, it's hit or miss, that room. It's not your people. You don't know the people. You know, you don't really know these celebrities. You don't really know what these people, these celebrities, they're into, what they like. It's not an easy room to play. So you want to know what? I say congratulations to Joe Coy. You did a hell of a job. It was so fast. And what I want to know was who was supposed to be doing it that they got him in 10 days before. I didn't read that part, but you know, just my two cents. Who am I? Who am I? On the TV talk note, I'm I'm four episodes into Wild Wild Country. Oh God. A documentary about the Raj, Rajneesh cult slash religion. I don't know. I They keep saying the Rajneesh call it a religion. The, 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 the people, of course, that are anti the Rajneesh are um, calling it a cult. It's about a uh, Indian group of people, like a commune, a kibbutz, whatever. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I you know, and they were in India, and they they came to Oregon. They set up shop, and it's so far the title's very correct. It's it's wild. I'm recommending it if you haven't watched it. I did finish though on Max HBO Max. Um, the cult of mother god about this girl oh oh god no pun intended amy carlson was a girl that was working at mcdonald's a woman working at mcdonald's and she went from mcdonald's manager to making a you know getting connected with the wrong people i guess in life and she made a uh she started a cult and it's it's insane it's just insane 
it's insane. And uh, Nick uh, Shager at the Daily Beast, he said something great. He said about the show, he said, it offers a unvarnished peak inside an insular community that demonstrates people's stunning capacity for con concocting and embracing ridiculous ideas to deal with unhappiness and trauma. And that is true. This is true of a lot of things. You, if you are sad, vulnerable, you're going through something, this is why everybody says, take your time, don't jump into a new relationship, be careful who you surround yourself with, you know, you do a lot of reflecting, but because you could get sucked in and to get out, it could cost you your life and it's a whole thing. You got to watch the cult of Mother God. And and let me just say this on this show. The people were broadcasting their um, stuff on YouTube. So the families of the children that were involved in the cult, you know, like the, the young adults, the, girl, the peop, girls, guys in the 20s, they were watching this from home. I mean, like, can you imagine? Anyway. Anna Nicole documentary, good, sad. Sad. I liked her. I liked her. Okay. Interior design glow up. Let me talk to you about that. So my daughters, did I tell you, you know, my daughters, they came home from Christmas and they said to me, they wanted to have a bedroom glow up. I, I'm like, what, how many things am I going to do? How many things am I going to do? And they know how mommy is. When I start something, I am like totally devoted and committed. And I just... My bed, my living room, excuse me, my living room, I did a glow up. You know, my living room, I told you, if you have been listening, it was uh, a gorgeous blue color. I love this blue. Van Dusen blue by Benjamin Moore. Dark, rich, regal shade of blue. My walls were Van Dusen blue. I had a blue couch, um, at leopard wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. It was a beautiful room um, and whatever. And I, oh, my built-ins were also the same colors as the walls. And I, the same colors as the wall. And then as time went on, as the pandemic and this, and I, you know, was home a lot, I, you know, the blue started to really make me blue. And so I said, let me lighten up the room. And since it's a girl's world in my house, as far as I'm concerned, slash, or coupled with the fact that my daughters were adorably excited about the Barbie movie and Barbie core, I said, let's. Let's do it up pink. And so we did pink and purple living room. And that's what I have now. And it's great. And it's fun. And somebody said to me recently, they said, why did you do your living room pink and purple? Like, doesn't that make you nauseous? I said, I said, you know why? I said, let me tell you something. I said, besides the fact that I love fun and I'm eccentric and I've always loved patterns and colors and anything that doesn't really go, I've seemed to be drawn to it. I said, besides for that, I said, my kids are only young once. My daughters are only young once. And one day, I'm going to look back on it. They're going to look back. And they're going to be like, we told mommy we wanted a pink living room. And she was like, okay. Or, or I'll say, how fun was it that when my, my, my dolls were little, I just decided, live your best life. Do it. I have my whole life, knock on wood, where I have no wood around. I have my whole life to have brown living rooms and more blue living room. You know, I mean, it's just paint. It's just paper. But I did buy the paper from Wall Shop. Uh, I think they are a British company because uh, they spell it the, the, that way. Wall, S-H-O-P-P-E. Um, I was telling you about it. You know, the removable paper. Re uh, Recap, what do they call it? Uh, update recap uh, yeah, sometimes you know things come out and you're just like what did I just say update okay so when I did the glow up for the living room painted the walls did the picture frame moldings painted them a different color did the uh the wall shop wallpaper I used removable wallpaper New York Times so you know gives wall shop uh, like five stars they say this is the best removable wallpaper on the market it's also expensive I didn't realize how pricey this paper was uh, until I was actually doing, you know, doing the, the, the dimensions, calculations, whatever. And then I needed more. You know, you always need more than what you think. Um, it's great. It's great. One slight, slight issue is, I um, let me see, do I see it now? I'm looking. In the corner of 
one area on the wall, the paper sometimes peels down. And I don't know if that's because the temperature in the room, you know, or maybe that's just like not a sticky part, you know, less sticky, but it's essentially like a giant sticker. So you know what? I would recommend it. If you want to do removable wallpaper, um, it's a pain in the ass to put up just like any wallpaper, but it looks really, really good. And it went on nice and it feels smooth and it's very high quality. And overall, it's sticking. Um, I will say, I don't know because I'm not a removable wallpaper expert, but I do think you get what you pay for. And if I would have taken my wall sconces down and my pictures down and put up crappy removable wallpaper that that constantly peeled everywhere or bubbled up or didn't look nice, I would be very upset because it was a pain. It was a pain. So my daughters want to do a glow up now in their bedroom, of course. And um, I'm not, I'm not going do I'm not going full bore. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge project to just make over a room with all the other stuff I go have going on and it's expensive, but I told them we'll do a glow up light, uh, because you know, their room is what it's been forever, like their baby room. And it pains me, pains me to change it, but I'm going to, uh, change out the curtains. Um, I'm going to get the curtains made. So I'm thinking about picking fabric. I might put up a few crown canopies above their bed and I'll probably do videos on it when I start to do it. And, um, you know, and then just like change a duvet, maybe go to Home Goods, a TJ Maxx gets a couple pictures. I mean, what, how, you know, it's like, again, I love the projects, but you know. Okay. There was, ugh, I can't, I just like, I hate, I, I feel like we can all relate to this. I was reading the New York Times ethicist as we do as we do, and as we talk about our opinions on it, there was a, a question that we can all relate to, and let me read it to you. Um, well, let me give you the abridged version. My best friend has a history of financial ruin. He has unpaid college loans at the age of, age of 50. He has a credit card. He runs it up to the limit as soon as possible. He owns a business that went bankrupt after two years, leaving the investors to hold the bag. He earns a low six-figure salary, consumed by payments on his debts. Now he's telling me he's planning on joining a, a group of very wealthy friends uh, to visit several countries in Europe this upcoming summer. And he'll be traveling with cash only. He can't bring a credit card because he has no credit. And the question to the ethicist that the writer writes in, should I convince him as his friend to decline the trip? I love you, but you can't really afford this. Or should I warn his travelers? Okay. Whether it's us or a close friend or a family member, I feel like we can all relate to that one person or people that have that's that 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 you have no idea where they get their money from, um, or, 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 and you know what they do for a living, or that you 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 know what they make and you know their lifestyle and they are walking around with absurdly expensive things and you know they have bills. Such a sensitive topic. The ethicist, this is what he said. He said, your friend has a serious problem he needs to address and he should get a financial therapist and they'll help one person coach their finances along with psychotherapy to try to help them break these bad habits. Um, and essentially he also said, um, if your friend can afford a plane ticket and hotels for his fancy European vacation, surely he could find the money to visit a financial therapist. He also said, uh, do not tell his friends that he has no money and he's in debt and he can't afford it because then you'll be out of a friend. You know, get it? Um, I totally agree. I totally agree on the advice. I think it's great advice. I think if it was my friend that was telling me they were going on a crazy extravagant trip and they were riddled with debt, I would say, you know, you know, like why I would do all that. Why we know we can't afford this. This is so expensive. Save it for a special anniversary trip. But 
the one thing I why I'm bringing it up is not only because we can all relate to people like this, and I think it was sound advice, is I don't think, and I don't know, but I don't know, think how many people understand there are these therapists that, that like specialize in certain areas. Like I know people are like, oh, I have anxiety, I'm I'm depressed, I'm gonna go see a shrink that specializes. But you can you can go uh, to a financial therapist. Like these people really exist. I have a friend uh, who's in business who goes to see a regular therapist and talks to his regular therapist about business decisions. And fine, that works. Uh, that that works for her. Great. But the reality is, is that when she goes, she's not really looking to change her business habits, whether good or bad. You know, with the therapist, it's not like she's trying to work on her mental health aspect, uh, or her behavior or her thoughts. You know, like patterns with this doctor what she's doing is she's trying to get advice right on on the decision she should make and I just don't think that that's the person that's equipped to give her that advice right and I've said a couple times not a lot a couple times you know there are business coaches like leadership coaches that that have had jobs for that have held really high um, positions in the corporate world or our business owners and entrepreneurs like real business owners you know like business owners that have sold their company um, and now they're like 60 70 80 years old and they're not working or they're living the good life and they still want to use their brain they want to help other people they love would love to help you know a younger entrepreneur they would love to help put their heads together and coach about uh, help not even coach you help brainstorm with you on your problems right there are uh people out there and sometimes you have to seek them out right and and people have said well you know th- you well you hear i should say in the zeitgeist you know people say oh you want to get yourself a mentor get yourself a mentor the reality is is that if you can't find a mentor within your own network or you don't want to because sometimes don't people don't want to find a mentor um in their own network of people because maybe they are, they their ego is involved. Maybe they don't want to reach out to somebody on LinkedIn because they don't want people to know it's them. You know, there are people you can pay for that will give you this kind of um, help. So my point is, is like in the case of my friend, a business leadership uh, friend, coach, therapist is what she should have. And I think that is somebody that should have the, um, the, the, the background and the resume to show the how they've been successful. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of fagazi people in this world. We know this, right? Just like this ethicist person. The ethicist um, advice I thought was great. A financial therapist is what's going to help you. Somebody that manages their own money or knows how to go to certain people and help them manage their money. Somebody that has the, 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 the lifestyle or the wealth or whatever to prove it somebody that has the clinical aspect of the cycle that you know what I'm saying I don't know it's definitely a tricky situation and we all seem to live hopefully not the the the, the Gen Z I feel like Gen Z is a bit different than Millennials and whatnot and the older generations but hopefully Gen Z um seems to be uh more sensible about living outside their means, you know? I feel like it's the older generations that are like, oh, I need the house, I need the cars, I need the bags, you know what I'm saying? Like, why, why? Uh, I have no effing desire for designer bags. Like, honestly, I mean, well, let me say this. Sometimes I, well, sometimes, every time I like to go do an inventory uh, scout, do a little do do a little browse in the high end stores because I love I love I love gorgeous things right I love to look every time I see one of those like Judith Lieber uh, or whatever the brand is you know like those crystallized little evening purses that are like a bird you know it's like a Swarovski crystal bird you know or a Chinese takeout container and they're like thousands of dollars I look at them and I'm like that's a work of art I love that but. But going around with the, you know, like a the giant, you know, tote bag with the dead person's initials on it. Don't get me wrong. I have one in my closet because I bought it a thousand years ago. But that stuff doesn't appeal to me as much, you know. 
as much. Anyway, anyway, um, I should have brought this up when I was talking about the, the glow up stuff. I found this new website called Auction Ninja. Auction Ninja. Auction Ninja dot com. They it's it's like it's like eBay, um, but it's for um like yard sales and tag sales in your area. And the only reason why, at first when I saw it, I was like, nah, I think this is a little fagaze. But then when I started to look through the website, there was this apartment, like this giant freaking apartment in Tribeca that popped up that was doing um, an in-person, like you bet you bid online and then you could pick up the item. Uh, they were doing this thing online, like they they had a catalog and all the stuff they were selling. And the prices, they I don't know, it was like beautiful lamps and couches and tables and the prices were like amazing um I didn't need anything but I was like wow is this like legit I I but check it out check it out so far I think it looks good auctionninja.com and on the um product of the week product of the week is a fun little thing that I found on Amazon that I'm loving these days and it's a plug-in I mean everybody probably have you probably have one already it's a plug-in essential oil diffuser it's the one that I got. I got a cheap one because I didn't know how much I was going to like it. $13.99 on Amazon. It's called Inno Gear. I-N-N-O Gear. Essential Oil Diffuser. It's a tiny little white essential oil diffuser. And you, it also lights up. So my kids like it because this thing, you plug it in and it lights up. But, you know, I put all these oils in it. I have these essential oils. Peppermint, eucalyptus, lemon. I love it. I totally love it. I, I live in a small space, so, you know, this size fills my room. Uh, news to me that people need big oil diffusers because you guys have, like, huge houses or rooms. I have, like, that doesn't even dawn on me. But it's a little cute thing. It could serve as a nightlight because, you know, because the, the multicolors. I love it. I mean, I've and I've had it now for, like, a year, which is a long time. It's not like I just stumbled upon this. Um, I could upgrade it. Because I don't really like the wire. That's the thing. It's it's the, the cute little petite white thing. It doesn't really go with my decor because I like gold. But it's the the white wire. Like it's long and I don't. But I, you know, sometimes I keep it in my kitchen. You know, I love it. Anyway, that's it for episode 151. I'm your host, Elise Luigi, And here is your quote of the day by Pablo Picasso. I love this quote. Our goals can only be reached through a vehicle of plan in which we must fervently believe and upon which we must vigorously act. There's no other route to success. And listen, you hear about overnight successes and shit like that, but then when you really talk to those people, they are like, I've been working for 30 years to make this stuff happen. Like, there is no shortcut, people. You got to make the plan, hard work, success. That's the equation. I'm Elise Tolucci. Love to love you, baby.